Ah, yeah? You alright? Good cue in the bar, isn't it? Yeah. Um, listen, this is pretty exciting for me. I'm sure it's pretty exciting for you, so let's just get on with it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Romero! He's actually here. Oh, um, very rare to get you in the UK. We're feeling pretty lucky. What was it that attracted you to Blackpool? We were here last year. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, wait. So I've got to make sure I don't ask you the same questions. We'll see what happens. I'll see you later. <laughs> um, 30 years of Doom. That's right. When was the last time you played it? Um, God, just two nights ago, maybe. How did you do? Oh, I was I'm making new levels for it. Oh, cool. Tell us about that. And is that uh, big for the 30th? It's for the 30th anniversary, yeah. I did, uh, I made, well, Doom, when it was released in 1993, had three episodes. And then in 1995, we made the ultimate Doom, and we added a fourth episode. And, and that episode is basically nine levels. There's eight levels and a, a secret level. So 95 was four episodes. And then uh, in 2018, it was gonna be the 25th anniversary. It's kind of a, a, a lot of years. <laughs> it's a good number. So I made a, another episode. I made episode five in 2018 and I named it Sigil. And then in software, my company that made Doom, yeah. they took it and they released it. So it's on all, all the console ports, you know, the Switch, all that kind of stuff. So Sigil is in the add-ons section of that. Um, and because it's the 30th, I figured why not make another episode so I'm making episode six, Amazing. and uh, that's Sigil 2. When's that going to be? That's on December 10th, it's coming out, which is the 30th anniversary of Doom. Amazing. Um, another anniversary that's happened recently, and I was only tipped onto this earlier today, is you know the level E1M8? Yeah, it was someone's, amazing. Zero Master. Someone's done it. Zero Master did 100%. Yeah, did you think that was even possible? No. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone played it and got near? Or? No. Um, so the, well, one thing I did want to ask you is most of our conversation is going to be about Doom. Do you ever get sick of talking about Doom? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just released my autobiography. It's called Doom Guy, so I kind of accept it. Yeah, you've embraced it now. <laughs> yes, embrace, you, embrace the Doom. Are, are you the guy on the cover or not? Yeah. You are? Yeah. I, yeah I, and the book talks about how that happened, but on the cover of the game Doom, that's me. So that's your six-pack? Not with pack. all the abs, but like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the pose. So you've been, um, so you're going to be signing your book for people yep. later, awesome. Um, I've been doing it all day. The book, how's, how's your wrist, okay? I, I, yeah, I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the book's doing very, very well. Yeah. Um, the weird thing about the book is, is that when you, I've read the opening chapters, when it starts, the book actually starts at a convention like this. Yeah. And it was kind of the first time that you asked about you. Um, are you embracing that now, telling your story? Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, Masters of Doom was a book that came out 20 years ago, and it basically talked about the rise of the shooter, you know, like, like it's software, um, it talked about the creation of all of our games, and then what happened after we, after I left, and the company kind of split up a little bit. And, uh, and it was just for a certain period of time, like maybe it was uh, about 10 years or something coverage in that, in that book. So my autobiography that came out is my whole life from the very beginning until today. And uh, in, in Masters of Doom didn't cover anything from when I was a kid. So my story from when I was a kid is very different than the way it, it starts in Masters of Doom. So a lot of people are, you know, have read that part and come back and tell me just like, wow, that was, yeah. Uh, how old, well, let's go back to that then. So how old were you, John, when you realized you could get a computer to do something that you wanted it to do? It was the same time that I saw a computer for the first time, which is uh, when I was 11 years old. And I went to, uh, so when I was 11, arcades were huge and everybody was playing in the arcades, but it takes money. And you're 11 years old, you don't have that much money, so you can't really play as much as you want. So my friend came home, on, uh, and my brother came, came to the house on their bikes, they're all excited, and said, we found out how to play games without any money. 
And I'm like, let's go. So I followed him. We all went on our bikes up to the local computer college lab. So we went to the college in town and we went to the computer lab and there's a giant mainframe in one room and the other room has about 25 terminals that have monitors and keyboards kind of you know, built together and started to play these text games that were university, you know, written basic text games. And, uh, and they're really different than arcade games, but they're really interesting and they took time, you could take your time. You weren't rushed to like hurry up and, and, and make a move constantly. So it was interesting to me, I could see like game design from a different angle than just the arcades. And I saw that there were just a few other students there in the summer and I was asking what were they doing and my friend said, oh, they're programming. You know, they're telling the computer what to do. And I said, how do you do that? And, and so they eventually, I, I was asking them, you know, what was on the screen. And they eventually gave me a book that, that described the basic programming language. And then I just started making my own adventure game right then. And, uh, and so the high level is that when I was 11, I went to the local college and taught myself how to code, not being in any classes. And, and that's what happened. And I did that basically for three years. I went to every like store that had a computer in it, and I could program BASIC on every computer back in the 80s. Yeah. So get on a computer, uh, Apple II computer, TRS-80 computer, Atari 800. Those were like 1970s computers. And, uh, and just taught myself how to code on, on any of them and just kept on practicing until in 82, we finally got a computer in the home, and then I was done going outside. What was what was that? What was the computer? The Apple II. Apple II. The Apple II Plus, yeah. Yeah, which has got a good version of BASIC on it, hasn't it? Is that, yeah, yeah, it has, it has, yeah, it's it was called AppleSoft BASIC. It's called AppleSoft because Microsoft was, they, we lic they, they licensed it from Microsoft. Yeah. The I can't let this go, because you mentioned the first game that you created, which was a text adventure. Yeah. Do you remember what it was about? It was just going through dungeon rooms and just seeing what was in the room. Dungeons are popular, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, was, I saw um, Colossal Cave Adventure then on the mainframe computer and thought that was like really cool. So I wanted to try and see if I could replicate that a little bit. Is there something about creating a, a game, because you're obviously still a developer now, yeah. is there something about solving the problems? So you want it, you want it to do X, but it's doing Y. And you're trying to fix it. Is there something still to this day that's really rewarding about fixing the problems um, of a game? Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, back in the day when you're learning how to program and things don't go right, then you kind of learn why they're wrong and you fix them. And you, so you keep on learning more and more about it. But nowadays, if something goes wrong, it's usually because of a, a dumb typo or it's because there's a functionality of an API call that's just not what you thought it was or it does something different, but, but it's, it's different after you've been programming for 40 years, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I'm not even programming the game right now because I, I have a pretty big team working on it. So, um, I think people would agree, you have quite a good memory of, we're talking 40 years ago. Yeah. Is it right that you've got some kind of condition that means you've got, not a photographic memory, but a ridiculous memory. Is that it's, right? Yeah, it's called hyperthymusia. So it's like Tell a, us about that, because I could do with a bit autobiographical bit. recall. Right. So things that I care about, things that I did, I will usually remember them. Um, just, I don't know. Some people have extreme hyperthymusia. Like, they remember every second of their entire life, and if you tell them a date, they'll tell you what happened that whole day in detail. I don't have that. <laughs> That's like a curse. Like, mine's actually beneficial because I can remember a lot of stuff about everything that I've done. And, um, you know, it's good for game design. If I, if someone, yeah. if I played a game back in the 80s and it had an interesting game mechanic, I can just recall it and just say, oh, we might want to try something that happened in 1984 in Whistler's Brothers, a game that had this really interesting mechanic, you know, and just kind of just remember that stuff because I played it. I liked it. Um, where you, you, you've got kids. Were they into games when they were growing up? And did you kind of... You know how when you're watching a film with somebody, you can spoil the film by saying, oh, I recognize that actor. They were very good in this other thing. You kind of spoil it because you're into the mechanics of the film. Did you find yourself kind of spoiling games for your kids because you just, you, you want to explain how it works? No, so, no, I like watching them discover. <laughs> I have six kids and uh, <laughs> there's only one that's not actually in the games. Give him a round of applause if yeah, you yeah, want yeah. to. Six kids. That's not easy. Yeah. 
The, old, the oldest is 35. Oh, wow. Yeah, 35, 34, and then there's 10 years before that for the four more kids. Yeah. So the oldest are in college. They're 19 now. Amazing. And, um, I mean, are, is programming something they do, game design, yeah. or have they gone off in different... Well, the 35-year-old has been in the game industry for 14 years now. He's a lead. He's Incredible. He's in charge of 20 programmers. Amazing. Um, yeah, the other, and, and uh, Mesa, she works with us. She's here today, and she's been on, working on a company for years, and she does a lot of different things. Game design, and, um, writing, and uh, social media, you name it. She, she kind of does everything. Fantastic. Can we talk about music? Sure, yeah. Um, so we, I put the Doom the track on before and people, the hairs go up on the back of your neck, right? <laughs> and I think this is something you probably are partly aware of, is that just you being in the room connects people with their childhood and something that's really special. I mean, is that right? It's yeah. kind of really special. Yeah. And music is a, a way into that. Were you aware it, it, when, when, when you were putting Doom together that music was the key to that? And what is it about your love of music that pushed that to the forefront? Uh, if that's not four geez. questions combined, sorry. Music, so was when we were making games, I made so many games before music actually was good in games. <laughs> in the 80s, music was great on Commodores and Ataris and stuff. On an Apple IIs, it was horrible. So they don't even count, really, um, until, you know, actual, like, say, MIDI music started. Um, I know that on other systems, they had trackers that sounded really great, you know, like there's a lot of good hardware out there. Um, but on our PC games, it wasn't until 1991 that we started putting actual games in, because PCs just started getting ad libs and sound blasters in 1989, 1990. Proper music chips. Actual chips, yeah, FM synth chips. So um, our games, you know, in, in 91 just started getting music, and we just like, to put a ton of music in our games at that time. And it, and, it, and it was it was like really important because I was excited that we had music and also it needed to represent the game's feel to the player. Because the player is gonna get like our, we're like telling the player what they should feel through the music. Yes. So it was important to make sure that that music was what we were trying to kind of telegraph. And with Doom, like with Wolfenstein before it, it was like very like World War II military stuff and it totally matched what that game was about. And with Doom, we're like, this is heavy metal. So, you know, we basically made a bunch of heavy metal midis. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it sounded it sounded really great. You know, we, we basically gave the composer a bunch of heavy metal CDs and said, approximate what you can what out you of can here. Yeah, yeah. Let's do what you can. And it was funny because I gave him CDs that, that I listened to and CDs that Adrian, who was the artist, uh, what he listened to, and when I got back songs that were like, well, that's exactly the song. And I told him, no, I can't use that. That's he copied the song, so we can't. Yeah, I can't take a copy. I like the, the, what it sounds like. Make something like that, and so he would redo it, and I would get that. But but then you know when we released Doom, and uh, it was it was a while after Doom's release when I get you know messages like. Oh, that's cool. You put that Slayer song in there. I'm like, no. What are you talking about? And I'm and, and I'm like, oh, it's because I didn't listen to Pantera and Slayer and and these other groups, and I didn't recognize when I got those songs that they were copies of the songs. So they went straight in the game, and and so there's videos, uh, YouTube videos that played the original song and played the Doom version yeah. of all the things I did not recognize when I was putting the music together. It's it's funny, you know, listening to you talk about. Um... The, the tone and the mood of the game and how you wanted music to enhance that. It's like someone talking about the composition of a film. So without getting too philosophical, we're talking about a game as art, aren't we? And I'm just interested in, in what your thoughts were then about gaming as art and what they are now. Well, back then I wasn't thinking about games as art. I was just, you know, trying to make something that was really fun to play. And I wasn't trying to think about it as art, because that was almost like an academic question at that time, 30 years ago. Nowadays, it's like, it's a huge, it's a huge question, and the answer is yes, it is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but back then, we're just trying to make something really great. And Doom was the only game that before we made it, we, we basically said, we need to make the best thing that we can imagine playing. You know, this, that's what this game needs to be, and we felt that we could do that. 
And, uh, and so we just worked for, it was 11 months, even though we started in January and shipped on December 10th, there were three weeks that were taken out of the middle of Doom because we needed to make the Super Nintendo version of Wolfenstein. And so the whole company had to just stop. We had kind of an emergency and we had to learn the Super Nintendo hardware. Uh, it was 65816's assembly code. Was that a, as big a task as it sounds when you say no. It was, yeah, we had to, like the music, we had to figure out how to make music, we had to figure out how to get our music in the format, we had to figure out what the graphics, you know, what, the, what the screen format was, how to get graphics on the screen. We had a real special way of doing that with, with our, our uh, Doom Render, with Wolfenstein Render. And, uh, and so we had to like do that as fast as we could um, so the whole team, there's only five of us, <laughs> the whole team was working on it, we did it in three weeks. So we ported Wolfenstein in three weeks so we could get right back on Doom as fast as possible. And it's a great job as well. It's, yeah, it's I, pretty I think good. for a lot of people seeing that on the SNES were like, oh, I thought I needed a PC for this. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. It was a pretty good version. Um, yeah, it worked out pretty well. I'm going to just keep us with music for a second because I do want to find out more about you. So if we're in the mid to late 80s, going into the 90s, what kind of music are you listening to? Uh, heavy metal. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Like Metallica, Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, yeah, 80s Metallica. Yeah. Um, and all, like, pretty much everything. Even groups that were just coming out, yeah, had just come out in, like, 89, like Skid Row and Full of Boys. Yeah. And, and groups Damn like that. Them. Yeah, all of that stuff. Yeah. I got excited in my research that I saw that you... <laughs> I hope this is true, I'll be, I'll be very <laughs> let down. That you like the Thompson Twins? I love everything in the 80s pretty yes. much. Yes! All 80s, I used to live in England in the 80s. So I oh, whereabouts? Uh, in Alconbury. Right. Alconbury is where I went to school, but I lived in Needingworth, which was near St. Ives. Right. And uh, just Cambridgeshire, right? And, uh, and so I went to uh, an RAF base, was where I went to school at, because it was an American base, military base, that we rented it, the U.S. had rented it from RAF, and, uh, and so I was going to an American school here, <laughs> and, uh, and it was because of the Cold War, because Russia was like, everyone's worried about the nuclear, you know, possibility, and, and all the U.S. needed to push forward as close as possible, uh, just in case anything happened, and so my father was in the spy program. And then, you know, the TR1s and the, U, the U2s, the TR, yeah, TR1s and, and U2s were flying and doing reconnaissance. And so he would be the person to get all the data off of those uh, recorders that they had, no matter where they came down, and, uh, and try and find out what's going on, what's the latest movements, you know. So around, decoding. Taking all of the audio and video data off the recorders yeah. and being able to, to give that to intelligence so they could figure out what's happening, what kind of movements are happening in Russia and all that. Oh my God. So that was what was happening. <laughs> That's what he was doing there while I'm listening to Thompson Twins. Yeah. And, you know, Oingo Boingo. So and like pleased to like the Thompson <laughs> Twins. Um, so speaking to you now, you're just like a nice guy, you know? And uh, I think, I was looking at the Washington Post's review of the book where they said, it's nice to see that an artist isn't the usual tortured soul who has done all the, you know, kicking televisions out of hotel rooms and stuff. Um, are they right in that, that you aren't really a tortured soul? You just, I mean, what's your philosophy on life? I'm making video games. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why would you be a tortured soul? You're just having fun your whole life making video games. Yeah. You know, it's really great. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm just positive in, in general. So, um, you know, and I love working with people. Uh, I realize that, that every day that we spend working on games is the reason why we make it. It's not because of when we ship it, it's every day that we do it. And uh, so everybody, be good to each other, have fun with each other. Um, you know, like, I like smaller companies because you know everyone in the company. And, uh, and, and that's the reason why you work with other people. If this was an American audience, when John said, be good to each other, you'd have all applauded. <laughs> but it's a Blackpool audience, so you have to ask them. Um, John, where do you live now? And tell me about a kind of typical day. I uh, live in Galway, Ireland, which is west coast uh, of Ireland. And we moved from the west coast of California eight, over eight years ago uh, from Silicon Valley right to Galway. 
and we had nothing left in California. Like we, we got sold everything, moved the rest of it, and uh, and have lived there since. And we have a game company uh, called Romero Games, and we started the office in 2015. And we've been making games since then. And right now, uh, been working on a shooter. So every day is going to the office and working with my team, part of my team, the rest of it's remote. Yeah. And uh, yeah, having meetings and writing stuff. And the office is, is near where you live, or is that in Galway as well? It's right in the middle of city center in right, Galway. Okay. Because, like, when you walk out the door, there's like five pizza places in front of you. <laughs> there's delis. There's you know everything that's around you. Like for, that's that's where all the tourists go. Yeah. So right in front of our door is one of the three hottest spots for tourism. As you can track through Wi-Fi, you know like where they are. The city knows where. But right in front of our door is one of the three hottest places where everybody goes. Is there a good development scene over there? And also sort of open that up and say, what, what do you think of the development scene in general now, as compared to, say, you know, the 90s? Uh, well, the thing is, the, the reason why we want to move to Galway is just, not, not only is it safer than the US where, you know, our kids are running shooter drills at school, kids should not be doing that. <laughs> Because there's guns are everywhere, everybody has a gun, so that's why we moved to Galway. But it's, um, yeah, it's just it's just a really great place to live, you know. Like the people are really nice, and I mean, sticking with the sort of uh, with the sort of game development scene just for a second. So, you know, if we go back to kind of the birth of um, first person shoot, first person shooters, um, which you are pretty much responsible for, um, is there another big thing coming, or is First person shooters, where we're going to be for a long time, or what, what, what excites you about what's potentially coming along? Well, there's always something really big that you will not know about when it happens. <laughs> That's interesting. It's going to be, it's always something that maybe one person knows, but no one else knows, like Minecraft. Like, nobody knew about Minecraft. Yeah. It came out and took over the world in 2009, and it's still being played like crazy today. But the funny thing is Minecraft was, was developed in public in front of everybody on a web page. And you could just see all the updates, but that's only for the few people that even stumbled on that page. But, you know, after it came out, it went everywhere. But nobody predicted Minecraft. Nobody predicted the rise of Facebook gaming that introduced hundreds of millions of people to games that had never played them. So let's talk about that then. So uh, when, when people are kind of, say if you're developing a game and you're, you're on Twitter or X. Um, yeah. When you're developing a game and you're kind of updating people, aren't you, on the progress of a game, people are asking you questions. So back in the day, if we go back to sort of the, uh, maybe the hype around Quake, and that hype was real, wasn't it? You know, it was kind of, what's this going to be? <laughs> yeah. And you were what? You were updating people with bulletin boards? Or how, how were you in touch with your community then? Uh, was it, was it BBS go, or? We would go on IRC usually, Internet Relay Chat. Um, so it was a very small audience <laughs> back then. Uh, and we would talk about basically what we were developing. Like, at, at id Software, we would talk about everything that we're doing. There was no secrets, you know, like while we're making a game, uh, we would just tell people, yeah, it's about demons and, you know, you know BFGs and stuff. But um, yeah, it was, it was pretty, yeah, we weren't, we weren't secretive about anything. Were people nicer on IRC than they are on... It's the same. It's the same. Totally the same, yeah. I mean, usually people were very excited to hear about what we were making, so everyone was pretty nice. Um, and nowadays, I'm like live streaming my de level development. Yeah, on Twitch. You know, on Twitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How is that? What kind of community have you built up there? Oh, it's really great. There's, yeah, people are really, really nice. They love it. Um, we have a Discord that's super friendly as well. So we have like a really friendly, safe place on Discord where lots of people from the Doom community come over and, uh, and, and just chat about games and, and we do contests and giveaways and stuff like that. Um, Instagram, we have a really nice Instagram uh, as well. But yeah, we, I, you know, and on Twitch, it's like while I'm, while I'm streaming, people are giving me ideas for stuff and I'll just like, yeah, what a great idea. Let me do that right now, you know? And I would just change the level because someone had a cool idea. So, going back to that period then, I mentioned about Quake, to, uh, to what degree around that period did you feel the pressure to do other games that were either like Doom or weren't like 
doom. Because there was games like um, Heretic, wasn't there? It was kind of doom in a more medieval setting. Like, mm -hmm. What was your thoughts at the time? Um, I wanted more doom games out there. <laughs> so like, I wanted to see more games because it was such a great engine and there were very few like doom clones is what they were called back then. There weren't that many other games for me to play. Like just our games and like, okay people, <laughs> make some cool stuff. So I was excited about licensing our technology to other companies so they could make games and, uh, and just like helping other developers at any, any time to, to, to develop games. So um, I helped the guys that made Descent, like you know, helping, helping them at the start of starting the company. I helped Half-Life uh, or Valve start up, yeah. Abe and, and Mike Harrington coming to, to our, our office and talking to them for a whole day about how to build dev teams and license our stuff. Uh, Ritual Entertainment, how to start their company, you know, help those guys get off the ground. Human Head Software, uh, like just many companies that I've spent lots of time trying to get them going. And uh, in, in back then it was like with Heretic, <laughs> was getting Raven Software excited to license our technology so they could make a game. And I said, Medieval Doom, here's how we're gonna do it. And it was basically a year later that I released it. So it was, yeah, it was, they did a great job. Um, I mean, as well, something we have to talk about then for talking about this kind of scene is, is the modding scene at yeah. the time, um, which isn't around in the same way, no, because uh, things are more locked It depends locked on the games. Yeah. You know, like City Skylines is, has a really popular dev scene. There's over 125,000 mods for that game. Yeah. And Starfield now has tons of mods. World of Warcraft, thousands and thousands, you know. So it just depends on the game. Um, not all shooters nowadays allow that. They don't allow dedicated servers and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so, yeah, so in some aspects, it's not as far as it's gone. It could have, could have gone, um, just because companies are a little more protective of their intellectual property and they don't want to lose the control by allowing people to just modify it and do something different. Um, but yeah, that's, that's more of a, like a money mindset kind of thing versus just a, a player oriented mindset where it's like, you can make the game what you want, we're making the next game. So go ahead, have fun with this one, we're already on the next one, you know? Um, so we have a modding is huge, you know? And the funny thing about modding is that for so long, people couldn't really mod games because they were made in assembly language in the 80s, and like, forget that idea. Um, and when people started to change, to create their own Wolfenstein levels, totally immediately recognized people need to modify the game and have more fun than just the levels that we put out there. So when we made Doom, part of Doom's, you know, list, bullet point list was making it an open game for everybody to mod it, change whatever they wanted. So we did that on purpose, and then with Quake, we actually put a programming language in it so they could do everything. You know, they could change the game to look completely different and make a whole new thing. It's almost like just an engine for them at that point. Yeah. So, uh, but modding, the funny thing about modding is that it actually started a long time ago on mainframe computers because everything was written in basic and people used to pass code around uh, in universities. And that's like the cost of paid adventure is actually two people, one person who modded someone else's adventure. Yeah. The second person yeah. put all the stuff in it. And, and even back back in the early 80s, there was these things called Eamon Adventures, E-A-M-O-N, and it was basically a skeleton of an adventure that you would copy around to people and you make your own adventure game in it and just copy it to someone else, they might add more to it. So modding was loosely like a thing back in the 70s and the early 80s, but not the actual big games that were in assembly language, because it was just not gonna happen. And I suppose to some degree the, the, the Twitch, the stuff you're doing on Twitch, lends itself to that, doesn't it? That people are saying, why don't you put this in? Why don't we try it? Yeah, it's like a live mod. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, some of your games are some of the most ported um, games of, of all time. What, what ports of Doom did you work on? And which were hard? You mentioned SNES earlier, but what, what, were, what were the hardest and what were the easiest, and, and have you got any specific memories about some of the Doom ports? So typically with our games, at the time, we would just let other companies port the games because we're making the next game. Yeah. And there's only five people who made Doom up until about September of 1993. Then we added another person, so we had six people when we launched a few months later. Um, and we didn't want the team to be porting anything. Like the reason why we ported Wolfenstein was because it was an emergency someone actually failed to do the port that we had hired. 
so we had to do it. And, uh, and so when, we, when it comes to like the Super Nintendo version, yeah. that just showed up in the mail. Someone had, the, the company had already ported it themselves and they just took a chance they ported it and sent it to us and said, would you guys publish this? And it was like, oh my God, can you even do that on a Super Nintendo? So, um, that Would was... you have had like a SNES in the office and put oh, it in Oh, we had everything. Gone? We had everything in the yeah. office, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we put the Super Nintendo version in there, like prototype part. And you were and, like, it, and we were just like, wow. Come and look at this. <laughs> They're a really great company too. Yeah. Uh, sculptured software. So we worked on the Jaguar Doom port in, yeah. in the in-house. Um, it was probably three weeks. Something like that, three or four weeks was pretty I've fast. That. I've got the Jaguar version. It doesn't have music. It doesn't, no. Yeah, unfortunately. Well, you can put the Thompson twins on, can't you, and yeah, play yeah. it? You can totally. Yeah. Why doesn't it have music? I think I know the answer, but just... It doesn't have the CPU to do it. Yeah. It didn't have the hardware. It didn't have, like, another chip to DMA the, the yeah. audio data. And so there wasn't the space like, to... Yeah. It, it had enough memory. It didn't have the horsepower to do it, because music takes a lot. <laughs> so it's not John's fault that there's no music. No, no, we in. did everything we could. The performance of the renderer was more important than the music. Yeah, and it is it is a great yeah. version, isn't it? It was a good version, yeah. And what are you working on at the moment? I'm I'm working on a, a two things. First is Sigil Two, which is coming out on August or August. It's coming out on December 10th. Uh, it's the 30th anniversary of Doom. Yeah. And it's going to be able, people can just download it off the internet, or they'll be able to get it with uh, musical tracks, like actual musical tracks. Like uh, Sigil 1 had Buckethead as, a, as cool. a whole soundtrack, and so this is different artists that make really, really great music. It's all metal, of course. Um, and then the other game is basically my you know, team you know, of like over 50 people every day. We're making a really big shooter. It's used Unreal 5, so it looks amazing. It's fast, yes. It's cool. I haven't made a shooter in 20 years, so it's uh, so that's one to look out for. It's gonna be cool, yeah. <laughs> right, I'm gonna do quick fire questions, and then we're gonna go to these guys because there's a lot of them, right. so it may take a while. <laughs> so let's do quick fire questions. Uh, right. What systems do you have at home, and what are you playing at the moment? Xbox X, um, uh, the PlayStation 5, a um, bunch of PCs, a bunch of Macs, um, and I'm playing Starfield and Baldur's Gate 3. Um, those are the two main ones. I cool. play a lot of Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Right. Um, what ambitions do you still have? To keep making games. Before you say that. <laughs> what's the best game you've ever made? Probably Doom. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what's the best game you've never made? Minecraft. Okay. Uh, World of Warcraft. Hi. Uh, was Britpop any good? I love I loved Britpop in the 80s. Good man. Great. Good answer. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite TV program? You know what? I met I met the the producer of Spitting Image recently. Oh. That was hilarious. <laughs> I was I was living here when that was on TV. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It was great. <laughs> it's good because you thought it was going to be shit. Gonna be shit. <laughs> uh, what's the best film ever? That's too hard. You know. Top five. <laughs> I'm not asking you. Star Wars episode four. Ooh. Ooh. Aliens. Uh, okay. There's a lot of them. Nice. Terminator. What's the best hotel in Blackpool? The best hotel? In Blackpool. Say no Is break. it the Imperium? No break. <laughs> right, give me a few words on the following games. All right. Uh, Dodgem. Oh, that's my first one. The yeah, list. 1982. Garbage. Garbage. <laughs> That's a that was an Apple II game. It Apple was II. Horrible. Uh, Pyramids of Egypt. Pretty cool game. And in fact, I recently just got an email from someone who needed the Apple II disc image to keep playing it because they accidentally cool. deleted their save games. Anyone play Pyramids of Egypt? Yeah. Well, I'd be really to. surprised if anyone did. Uh, Evil Eye. Same Evil here. Eye. Yeah, that was that was asteroids. Oh right, okay. Yeah. Uh, Zaparoids. Also asteroids. Not. Kind of. A little bit different, but it's very asteroid-like. I've got a good one now. Commander Keen 3, Keen Must Die. That was fun. That was... Uh, so much fun. Yeah. One of the things that was fun on there was we had Messi. It's like Messi, the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. And Messi would take you to a whole new island on there if you found out where Messi would stop. Uh, Catacomb 3D. Catacomb 3D was the first texture-mapped game. 
that led to that Wolfen led to Wolfenstein. Yeah. yeah. Ultimate Doom. Ultimate Doom, episode four, very difficult, um, and got Doom into retail for the first time. Yeah, on shelves. Actually, the original Doom. Doom 2 was in retail half a year before it, Yeah. but did the original Doom that we were selling mail order, that was the first time that that got into a store. Yeah. Do you remember walking into a store and seeing it and going, yes, get you in? Well, what was funny is like Doom, people wanted Doom 2 so badly, they didn't even put it on shelves. They brought the pallets into the front of the, the, the computer stores and just took the pallet apart and everyone just came in and picked up a box. It was useless to put it on the shelf, just like Super Mario 3 when it came out. Amazing. Uh, Doom 64. Made just outside our office. The programmer, Aaron Sealer, was, was there to get any technical inform information that he needed from John So they were Carmack. literally next door? Or? It was right there next door office. Yeah. Amazing. Um, this is a massive on Facebook, in the, uh, Ravenwood Fair. Yeah, Ravenwood Fair is, is uh, my first Facebook game that I made in 2010. And it was made in two months and 19 days uh, by eventually a team of 12 people. And it was huge. Like the first yeah. month, there were 4 million players. And over six months, 25 million players a month played that game, which is double World of Warcraft's top. Uh, and it, it was people love that game, and there's a there's a thread of almost a thousand messages on Facebook right now of people just begging for that game to come back, and just like their memories of how they loved it. So I've been to I've been I've been to like places where uh, like Brenda's showing off one of her games like Train, and then I have a a, a, a mom and their kid asking me about Doom and Ravenwood Fair. <laughs> Uh, how long did you say it took to make Ravenwood Fair? It took two months and 19 days. Okay, tell me about the game that took you 10 hours. Uh, that was called July, July 4th, 1976, and it yeah. was a game jam. So my, one of my programmers who actually moved to Ireland from California with us, he came uh, to a game jam. We do game jams all the time. In fact, the current big game I'm making was from a game jam game. And, uh, and so he was, we basically went to this Galway game jam, because. Galway has game jams all the time. And it was a 10 hour jam. So you come in and at 10 o'clock, everyone is told the secret word and it was called charged, was the word of the day for us to make a game that had to do with that word in some way. So we made a game called July 4th, 1976. And it's, and it's actually a very disturbing game. And uh, some people wouldn't even play it just watching the menu screen and listening to the music. They're too scared to even run it. So it was great. And you can actually get off the App Store uh, on Android, it's on Windows, and just go to playbarf.com. <laughs> it's, it's a site where I just put crappy games, and, and, it, and it is crappy, but it's, it's a 10 hour game. But it's on four different systems. And it's, just, it's disturbing, it's, and it's a different kind of game. But yeah, we're we made it 10 hours on that one day. Um, did I manage to ask you any questions that you haven't been asked before? Oh yeah, lots of them. Good. Yeah, great, great job, great job. Nobody else brought up the Thompson Twins. That's right. Okay, that's enough of me with John Romero. Now it's time for you with John Romero. Put your hands up. Okay, All right. right. Um, do you want to come forward? Because these mics have a limited range. You come up first. A quick one for you. What's your favorite Doom Wad? Probably my house. Wad, yeah. It's, it's, I'd say 30 years of Doom. It is the coolest Wad I've ever seen. Yeah. Okay, who's next? Run down here. Run down here, I reckon. <laughs> oh, like, you don't oh, run, do you know? I want to ask a question, but I don't want to walk up there. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> go for it. Following on from your, uh, your quick question shoot, my quick question shoot will be. What is your favorite Judas Priest and Metallica song? <laughs> Judas Priest song, very hard to pick. Painkiller, obviously, yeah. is badass. But I love a lot of the other songs on that album, too. Metallica. Metallica, Metal Militia. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a shame you're not on the video. Can you just walk past that video so as we get you on the... Because it seems like we're, they're only getting half the right. story. Seeking Destroy is also pretty great. Right, who else has got a question? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Build up. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much. 
Hello, I've got a question. Yeah. So, um, is there anything you'd love to put in the game that you haven't put in the game before because of hardware limitations? Thinking about the future in the next 20 years since you're going to going to keep making games. Is there something in the future you'd love to like introduce maybe in 20 years when um, a technology moves forward? Well, you know, it's funny because in 20 years, it's going to be crazy. It's already starting to get really crazy with AI right now. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm not doing it in this, this game that I'm making, but I'm really excited about putting characters in my game that are going to say things that I had no idea that they would say because of AI. You know, and so like right now, people are making games where you're talking to NPCs through a headset, which takes your voice, turns it into text, sends it to GPT with a bunch of parameters, making sure that the, the character is going to say things that they should say, and then comes back with the information in a way that, that you know the designer had never created, and then it turns it back into speech, so it goes text to speech, and then you hear the character talking with lip sync and everything. Um, that's going to happen very soon. Like oh, that is going to be in game very soon where your sidekick is, you're just talking to your sidekick. That's so just, exciting. You, you don't even have to play the game, you just sit there talking to them. Um, so that's going to be a thing really, really soon. And if that's happening right now, there's no way to predict in 20 years. Yeah. No way can you understand what's going to happen with this way that AI is going to affect everything. Okay, who's next? Bill Thor. Oh no. <laughs> Here you go. What is the scariest game you've ever played? Wow. Um, Resident Evil 4. Ooh. It is pretty scary. It's a game that, like, before I play it, I have to just, like, get ready for terror. Because it's nuts. That game is so good. One of you my top the, ten. Have you played it in VR? In VR? Yeah. yeah, Biohazard in VR. Also scary, but not like 4. Um, but if, anyone's, if anyone wants to play something scary in, in high quality in VR, uh, you know, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard is so good. I mean, you're going through like a you know, haunted mansion basically in, in, like the, in a swamp. And you're walking around really slowly in VR and like bending and looking around corners and all kinds of crazy stuff happens in it. It's nuts. It's really good. I was just wondering, would you do Doom in VR? There is a Doom in VR. Is there? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should check it out. <laughs> yep. It's really cool. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. Did you ever um, play uh, Rise of the Triad back in the day when Doom was about? I did not play Rise of the Triad. Um, just a little bit at the very beginning. It's made by Tom Hall. Uh, so when Tom left id Software, he started working on Wolfenstein 2, a sequel, at Apogee. Um, they, they named themselves 3D Realms at that time. And so he was, play, he, was, he was making that game, and then we decided we don't want someone else to take our Wolfenstein IP. We want to kind of keep that internal. So we told him, make it into something else, that you can use the engine. So he came up with Rise of the Triad, and it has a lot of innovation in the game, like the multiplayer modes of the game are really innovative. It's a lot of, a lot of Tom Hall hilarious, um, you know, jokes in there and sound effects and, and just his, his zany style is all over that game. But yeah, it's a really good game. And they just, they've had Ultimate Rise of the Triad, they're doing a, a reboot of it and everything, remaster. What do you think is the most underrated console port of Doom? Underrated? <laughs> well, Maybe the ones that no one has paid for, the one like, you know, Doom runs on everything now. Um, <laughs> and when I see Doom running on a VIC-20, I'm actually way more impressed. Because that is a very hard computer to try and make Doom run on. Because um, it's, yeah, it wasn't built for, for that at all. So I'm actually more impressed with that than, say, PlayStation port, which is like one of the best. You know, that's a really great version of it. So Doom 64, uh, technically, is really great. Um, but yeah, I, you know, probably the VIC-21, really amazing to see that. How did you respond to the moral panic that emerged around Doom? Uh, it was not a big deal to us. Like, we were in Texas and we didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> the funny thing about it is like, we didn't understand the moral panic. We're like, 
you're killing demons, they're bad. Like, what is wrong with this game? You are in the future killing demons because they're trying to take over Earth. Like, what? that's good. <laughs> so we just don't understand why people are upset about it. Like, like Wolfenstein, why are you mad that you're killing Nazis? They're bad, you know? So, so anyway, yeah, we were not even phased to didn't really care. Um, speaking of Wolfenstein, what's the um, what's your opinion on the latest installments that ID ID made? Well, yeah, the Young Blood and, and um, all the all the, the machine games versions of Wolfenstein are really great, and they keep on getting better. And I really like the fact that they're taking the story in different directions um, versus versus like a lot of rehashing that they did for a long time, where you know like we didn't go as far into the, like, Hitler's belief in the occult as a, power, as a power that he could use. And they did do that beyond, say, um, Spear of Destiny, which is about Hitler trying to find the, the spear that pierced the side of Christ as a holy object that would bring him power, and all that. So we made that game, um, and then it got, you know, pulled into more of the occult type stuff. But the fact that it's kind of gone away from that, and, it, and now you're, you're playing with his, you know, B.J. Blazkowicz's daughters and stuff, really great to see the evolution of the franchise. So I 100% support all of the machine games versions. Hi. Um, probably a bit of a boring technical question. Oh. But um, <clears throat> obviously 3D being quite an expensive way of doing stuff. <laughs> what amazes me with sort of Wolfenstein and Doom is that logic of going from a 2D over the head game basically and somehow turning that into 3D without it really being 3D. So what gave you that kind of leap of logic to go, right, how can we do basically a 3D game far more cheaply without actually doing all that proper 3D processing? Uh, well, it was, it was all about like, you know, every 3D game you can just say is the illusion of 3D, you know, I mean, it's just a projection of a space. And so how you define that space is what your game is gonna be. And the reason why Doom doesn't rotate or, or, or you don't lean in Doom is because this, we needed speed to make the game feel good like we did with Wolfenstein. You can't lean in Wolfenstein either. You can't look up and down. Like You don't have that many degrees of freedom, but with the limits of freedom, you get speed. So that was really critical is the fact that we could, you know, that speed would, for us was the most important thing and that the, the player felt like they were having a good time. And with Doom, we'd already shown with Wolfenstein that we could get that speed. And so for us, we could do it, you know, machines had advanced, computers had advanced by the time we made Doom. And we wanted to push it a little bit more. So we had diminished lighting, we had texturing on the ceiling and the floor. And the data structure of Wolfenstein and Doom are completely different. And the reason is because we pushed the Wolfenstein data to its limit and it still, it, sh it still like presented a world that was limited and not as good as what we were hoping to, to, to put out on the screen. So we needed a different data structure to describe a world that was what Doom is. And, in, and the funny thing is that before, before Doom, Wolfenstein and every game ever made on a computer had 90 degree walls. You turn corners because everything is represented in a matrix for all of the 70s, all the way until Wolfenstein. And that is a super limitation. If you've ever played uh, you know, Ultima or Bard's Tale or Wizardry or Might Magic or any of these games that have a 3D render, it's always 90 degree walls and halls that are you know, corridors, basically. And we wanted to present a world that looked way cooler than that. And, uh, and we had no examples. You know, we just knew that <laughs> You know, this is not the future. So um, coming up with line segments and sectors to represent a world and have line segments be on any angle and figuring out how to render those, you know, to kind of be, you know, really getting them in order into a, into a, um, into a set that made sense that we could quickly draw was, the, was basically the biggest part of making Doom. Um, and then it made a world that had high, you know, high ceilings, low floors, uh, bright lights, dark, dark areas, and so we could contrast everything. And then the co contrast of experience was, was the other important part where we have exploration and then we have crazy combat. 
and then you kind of go between those things. In between that is going into a room that even looks like this. You could totally make this, this room except for the ceiling. <laughs> you could have it flat, but, um, but we could represent this room in Doom. And, uh, and that was what really got people excited when the game came out because we just advanced technology by getting away from that entire 2D representation of worlds that every game before us for decades had been doing. So that was a huge step forward for all games. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was, it was difficult to do, you know, it took us 11 months to do it, but, um, but we really focused on that problem as the number one thing. And this last one, I'm told, is a statement, not a question, so with due trepidation. Hello, um, um, yeah, no, basically, uh, when I was a little kid, I had a PlayStation 1, well, I didn't, I always stepped at that age. And the reason he won me over was because I had Doom without a memory card. I played that game without saving it and slept it on and it kind of changed my life as a gamer because I remember playing that game and that game scared the crap out of me, if I'm honest. <laughs> I was only about eight year old at oh, the wow. time. <laughs> that yeah. game, it was different to me and yeah, that's amazing. I just want to say thank you, basically. Well, thank you all for playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, John is staying with us at the event. He's signing copies of Do Guy, My Life in First Person. But for now, can you all thank the amazing John Romero? Yeah. 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 In the training hall, you may have seen me there. So if you want to meet Johnny's in the training hall, uh, we'll see you back uh, for another panel at four o'clock. We'll see you at four o'clock, folks. Thank you very much.